nothing left for me to hate so I can lay me down my brothers on the ground I bled today until Coyote comes to raise me up and carries me Hello everybody, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. I am Cami Black, I'm back after um, what can only be described as a manic 24 hours where I thought the entire household had uh, coronavirus, but we're all clear, involved a four-year-old child having a nosebleed whilst I was trying to administer a PCR test and then needing, a, needing to go for a wee in the car park where you're not allowed to leave the car. So that was that was a wonderful stress free afternoon out, and then they, everyone else in the house got their results back first thing in the morning, saying they were clear, and I had to wait another three hours whilst I was convinced the whole time that I had coronavirus, but I'm fine. So John John stepped for me last week, um, so I'm very grateful to that. Apart from the fact that I had to uh, edit out some uh, t- some legally dubious comments from the Patreon only uh, podcast, so. <laughs> But this is what happens when I'm not here, and I wasn't even there either. See, no, this I thing actually, I'm actually the, one of the more calming, uh, you know, presences around here. Cami, people don't know this, Ian, do they? Ian Hayes joining us. Good evening, Ian. I, oh, hello. I don't want to like hang about to dry when he's not here, but I don't think it was me or Craig either. No, no, it wasn't. No, it was, it's, it was, it's, it was <laughs> that other one, isn't it? Yeah. I stayed very, very, very quiet. <laughs> it's not it's like me. Fine. Look, it was behind the paywall, and we've edited it out now. Awesome. Yeah, that's fine. Those, you know, those comments about what Mark Dodson gets up into his uh, private time. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what it was about, by the way. Um, yes. So we've also got you hear the voices of Craig Manson and Johnny McGinty there as well. Oh. Good evening, Craig and Johnny. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Um, yeah, so um, we're live at the moment on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. So if you're watching live, feel free to get in touch on the comments, uh, and we'll read out some of the best ones that grab our attention. Um, we uh, are also, I've mentioned our Patreon there in passing, so you, you get a bonus weekly episode now where we uh, we kind of just chat about random stuff, a little bit about rugby, a little bit about other stuff. Um, we swear a little bit as well. So we do that immediately after this. So you get two episodes of your Patreon. And you can sign up at that, patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast for from £3 a month. Uh, you can pay £5 a month and you'll get your name read out on the podcast and we'd be eternally grateful to you as well. That just kind of helps us cover the costs of streaming this live every week and, and other bits and bobs as well. Um, you can visit the blog as well, scottishrugbyblog.co.uk for um, articles, news, views. You can read Ian's match report from... Scotland women versus Italy that we'll we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and we're also on various social media places that occasionally I, I remember to update, like <laughs> Instagram. I'm sure it's just for the kids that I, I can't I can't be the one with Instagram. It's I, I keep thinking I should we should get a TikTok, but I don't know what we do. Oh, I don't really understand oh it. God. Can we not? Oh, even no, the I thought just... even the thought of it makes me makes my hip hurt. <laughs> I saw people dancing and stuff like that. I, don't... I, can't, I, don't I said need... on the Patreon bit last week I disagree with TikTok as a concept. So 
Mm. Is that because of the involvement of the Chinese government or because you don't like flossing, Johnny? It's yeah, it's because I'm too old and I don't understand it. And I'm moving on. Essentially. To I mean, we're, we're all done here. And I think if anyone, like anyone around about my age who would try to do it, you know, 39, I mean, I think you're just try, trying too hard. You, you've seen some like proper cringy as anything stuff on there on the few times that it's not it's not for us no i have to have a pvg for my job now i can't be hanging about on tiktok (laughs) so yeah so we're not we're not on tiktok there you go um anyway um so we've got a a little bit to cover this week in the in the regular podcast um shall we start we can talk about the scotland women versus italy ian you did the match report for that Uh, i watched it back today um it, I, I knew what the result was going in, and I was surprised how well Scotland women actually played for large portions of the match, despite the result. Yes, but um, it's I mean, it was very reminiscent of the the last time two sides met, uh, but it's Scotland. Um, even a lot of the same try scorers. Um, Scotland at the moment, they just seem. They switch off at the start of games. They they give themselves a mountain to climb. They always concede early, and then there's like moments of just defensive fragility. You know, there's either someone's not got their spacing right, or there's a weak tackle, and once that line's broken, they're done. And it's you know, it's, it's they don't seem to have learned much from that last game. Even uh, the the blight side flanker, um, was her name uh, Giada. Uh, she scored at the you know, at the brink of half time that week and also during the Six Nations game. And again, it came off the back of Scotland just scoring, thinking, right, we've got five minutes to ride it to half time. We're back in the game and then conceding points. Um, I mean, Brian Eason, if, if he could, you know, get hair implants, he'd probably pull his hair right back out. Because it's, um, Scotland, Scotland they, do, they do play well, but then as soon as turnover possession, is conceded they get counters. I mean, you have to give credit to Italy. You know, some of the tries they scored were excellent, some of the offload. Yeah. But a lot of the time it's just things look misaligned and I've got a fly burst about my face, right? So I thought you were just being expressive there, Ian, when you'd said the word <laughs> misaligned. Well, like like an Italian, like you know, proper Italian like, <laughs> big hand gestures. And that's um, the fly. Craig, it was I mean it was, it was hard. I mean the, like Ian says you you can't really slip off tackles the way Scotland did, and I think almost every Italian try was was down to that. Was you know, it was three or four missed tackles, and if you're doing that, any team is going to walk in a try every day. That's the biggest issue is 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 the minute you you know Ian's talking about some really nice um, offloads and really nice handling work from the uh, the Italians. It just comes from that first missed tackle or the slipping off, just as you say, a slip off tackle, um, letting them go. And and even though you're, they're falling to the ground, they're still managing to get their hands free, the ball free, and they get, they've got good support. Um, it, it, it was difficult to watch at certain times, um, but two things for me. Um, first things first, I am fully in awe of how these women work, handle a job, train as professional, well, train as professional adults, uh, athletes, I should say. Some of them are professional, some of them aren't, uh, and still turn out to play against teams that are paid fully and, and are, 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 um, uh, don't have to work as hard as they do. Um, and second of all, Jade Conkle is just, um, I've, known Jade for for some time now. I met her uh, the first time I ever met her was down at the uh, Murrayfield finals. We had a, uh, the How Harlequins had got into the, the bowl final and we met Jade because all the captains had to be there for some press and Jade is just a, um, a striking figure and she has continued to be and uh, it was great to see her back on the field. Um, she was a presence on the, uh, on the weekend. The, the other presence for me, Johnny, I, I thought Rona Lloyd in the back, sort of like defensively, had an absolute kind of stand-up performance. I think the some of the tackles that she was putting in at the end, she she almost saved a couple of the tries. Kind of like given the, the number of tackles, I mean, she put in some really big hits, and I kind of it's quite exciting the prospect of her going over to France and to see what what she can then do next. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's really exciting. Um, it's great for her to have the opportunity. I think that's that's a good chance to really kick on because that's it's a, it's an amazing setup that they've got over there. That that's kind of the opportunity you don't get many places around here. And I think people as well don't realise, like we've said already, so many missed tackles, so many slipped off tackles. When it's when that's happening around you, how much harder it is to keep getting up and making your hits every single time. I thought she did a really good job. Yeah. And it is hard. I, I don't know. I, I kind of, I didn't want to come on and like Craig was saying, come on and kind of talk about the structure of women's rugby in Scotland. But it's really hard not to when there's a result like that because it's not going to be, I don't know, it, there needs to be something fundamental Otherwise, these results are just going to keep happening, and you know you wonder what's what's in it for the players at that point. I, I Craig, you make a valid point. You know the the they give up the time, they give up the the work. Some of them will have to take time off unpaid to go and play these games, to to turn up and get kind of helped. They think well, something fundamental has to change at the top in the way that women's rugby is structured in scotland and there has to be a way of it's not good enough i don't think to just say craig or go and you know go and apply a trade in france go and apply, try and find a contract in england that's not a solution it, it, it really isn't because you know you what really what we want and what what i want what what we need i feel is that the, the scotland team training and playing in scotland because a it's easier um, it's easier to to have your Scotland camps etc and bring the team together um I'm not adverse to the to, to the girls that are playing and being paid to play in, the, in England I don't have a I don't have an issue with that whatsoever but if we could make them all professional um then they don't have to worry about of getting up at six in the morning go training uh, go to the gym whatever then go to work then um, go back to the gym or go to training at night then get some sleep. Uh, it, it just, it must take a toll somehow. Um, and, you know, you're going up against, for example, you know, how they manage every 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 year to go and play the, the Red Roses, I'm amazed. Because they're looking at players who are being paid. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think they're being paid enough, but they're being paid and they are solely um, being, um, what's the word? They're solely... Um, being paid to do that job, and they come in and, and they're so strong, you know. So I, I, I'm in, I'm in awe of the Scotland's women, the, the women, the Scotland women's team, um, and all of the, the women that play in Scotland, you know. Yeah, and I think that's that. That you kind of have to caveat any kind of criticism of performances with that, don't you? And you know that they've had the time in camp together, but it's, you know, it's it's limited time. It's not that there's a couple of professionals in England, and now we've got. You know, run Lloyd off to France, but it it is it does limit kind of the I suppose the ambitions that Scotland can have as an international women's team. Uh, yeah, even though you know individually they're getting recognised, there's now um, actually I think in the starting lineup there were eight um, players who sort of are playing professionally. I think five of them are at Loughborough Lightning alone, uh, mm. and then you had like Sarah Law on the bench. Um, mm. Uh, but, you know, you just have to look at the example of uh, Japan at the 2019 World Cup there. You know, a lot of them, they, they've never played together. Uh, then they set up that club mentality and they, they excelled. This is what, this you know, Scotland, like we've been saying, they get a couple of weeks together. Um, they've even had, you know, there's constant coaching overhauls. Unfortunately, Phil Doyle had to leave because of some COVID-related issues back home. Um, and even though Brian Easton's kind of you know, followed in his footsteps you know, quite seamlessly, they just, uh, you know, for all the individual talent, they don't have enough time to, to be together uh, and to train as a team together. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if we could get an, a, a professional team, even a semi-professional team uh, that was Scottish-based and, you know, try and squeeze into some other kind of league um, like the... Uh, is it 15, uh, 15 teams they've got in England? Premier 15s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Premier 15s, yeah. yeah. You know, if we could try and squeeze in there, um, I think it would be greatly beneficial. Um, but, you know, obviously with funding as it is, 
uh, you know, setting up a women's team would take some kind of out. I think it would take some kind of outside investment, but I think it would be the best way forward. Certainly. Yeah, I mean, but it's hard, isn't it? Because outside, it's you know, which comes first, the outside investment or the women's pro rugby team. You can't ask for outside investment for something that doesn't exist to set it up. At some point, the SIU are going to have to stump up some cash. If they're serious about women's rugby in Scotland, they're going to have to stump up some cash to create a women's professional rugby side, find somewhere for them to play regularly, and then get the sponsorship in. Because you, you know it's hard. You're not going to get sponsors in Johnny to sponsor something that's, you know, a, a dream. The you know it, we're thinking of setting up a team. We might try and get in Premier Fifteens, come along and sponsor us and see what happens. Yeah, no, they they definitely have to have to make initial moves. They have to have a solid plan for it. I think that Fosrock were involved in Super Six right right from the start, but that was something that they had a solid plan for. So it's not like they were going, oh, we might have some teams, we might have a competition, would you like to sponsor it? They've obviously gone to Fosrock and said, we've got all these proposals for all of these teams, we are going to build this semi-professional competition, this is the plan for how it's going to operate, do you want to sponsor it? So they have to do something at least similar to that with a women's team, and they have to know that they're going to get into Premier 15s. They don't have to have the team, I don't think, but they have to have a solid plan and they have to know where they're going with it, when and how, before they can get any money for it. You can't just rock up to somebody's door and say, we fancy maybe having a women's team, do you want to pay for it? Yeah. So, man, who's got the Hells Angels in there? Yeah, it's me. I'm going to go shut the window two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> They've turned up to take you away, Johnny. <laughs> Come to reclaim their debt. <laughs> I owe them nothing. <laughs> But that's, I mean, you know, there's there's no reason why, I mean, you know, Wales have got similar issues. I think they've probably been a bit more brutal with the women's setup than Scotland. Scotland, at least they're trying something. It's not necessarily built on the strongest of foundations. But the, there is uh, something there to do a Celtic league, although there'd be travel costs, because I don't think the, you know, the island will have more professional women, but I don't think they've got anywhere to play outside of Ireland. Wales women have have got the same struggle. So even if Premier 15s, the RFU aren't interested in a Scottish pro side, you would think you could have a shadow URC tournament. Yeah, they've just finished that um, Provinces Cup in the Irish Women's Rugby. Yeah, where mm-hmm. they all had to change. Where Did you see where they uh, yeah, behind the bins. Yeah. yeah, Connacht had to change behind the bins and they actually had footage of rats. Yeah. Yeah, it was not great. Nope. But yeah, I mean, Craig, it's is that the solution? Do you think the kind of like you go for a kind of I don't know, like the men's equivalent, I suppose, would be Argentina and the the Jaguars, and you have a, a pro team made up primarily of your professional players that then essentially is your you know that can play in a kind of comp- a cross border competition that then at least they're playing at a high high level that translates to international. I think that's the only that's the only way to go. Um, I think the issue you have is. Um, you know, we we can't. What what you're looking at is getting um, value for money. Um, the SRU aren't just going to, you know, uh, select you know thirty six to forty players and pay them a professional wage um, just for you know and just be reserved to be Scotland players. Um, they would have to be, uh, and it would have an effect on then the 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 um, the prem. Uh, in Scotland as well, the Prem, the Prem League. Um, you know, you're going to where are you going to play? See Scotland players that are being paid to play, etc. So you would have to have something like a professional team um, that would go. Um, and uh, you, you want to get fans down to to get some return on the, on the money as well. So I think uh, uh, very much. I think looking at the the URC and how it's going to hopefully develop with the the backing that or the the the, the people that are behind the URC um you would hope that we're going to see a few more steps for equality um or more equality yeah, that way because you, you could see CVC saying that can't you look we've we've taken we've paid a big chunk of money for your competition we're here to try and grow it the fastest growing branch of rugby i think at the minute is is women's rugby Hmm. What what are you doing in in within your unions to develop that? And the answer would be, well, 
Ireland are making the women change behind the bins. Wales have completely torn theirs apart. Scotland are muddling along. Mm. And, you know, I think South Africa, you know, well, Scotland beat South Africa, I think, when they went out on tour there. So yeah. I don't think any of them are particularly um, cover themselves in glory. And you wonder whether CVC turn around and say, why, why aren't you tapping into this? The most commercially successful sporting thing we've seen in ages was the 100 this summer. Mm. And they had men's games and women's games on at the same time, equal billing given to everybody, everybody, equal prize money as well, I think, actually, in the 100. Yeah. So it's, I wouldn't be surprised to see someone who's professional, like their job is to buy into sports and make them commercially successful, look at that and go, that made a ton of money all summer, so let's see if we can do something like that. And well, you look at it. No, you go on, Craig. So uh, this is what this is a ha- my hands in the ruck is, uh, and 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 we'll talk about it more further down the line. But um, we we ha- again we, we we will come back to the men in blazers controlling um, rugby as a whole. Uh, whether it's whether it's your local rugby team, whether it's your professional team, whether it's your your Scotland um, your Scotland board, etc. They are. There is no until we start getting more representation on those boards, um, and it's you know we're, we're not just getting um, you know we're not that we're not just getting talked down to all the time. Then you're going to find that we, you know, you won't you. I can guarantee you, you'll never find a, a senior men's fifteen of a rugby club changing behind the bins, um, and never mind a professional teams women's team you know what i mean i'm talking about a local rugby team their senior men are treated like the be all and end all within the with, within their clubs they would they, you know if they couldn't get changed in a nice safe environment they would be absolute hell to pay and this is the again we we have to look at rugby clubs and maybe turn rugby clubs around upside down a little bit and say actually we're we're dealing with you know the senior men get to play their game because of the junior teams, the 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 children's teams, the 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 women's teams, the second teams, the old boys teams, because they are the ones that are paying the money and not getting a huge amount out of the club. Well, well, yeah, my my experience of, of rugby clubs, of any rugby club, you go to any rugby club in Scotland or even in, around the country, and it's being run by women. The committee, the committee of the men, but the day to day running of the clubs, the people behind the bar, the people making sure that the the, the teams of the children's teams are going out every week that there's food for the senior players all that the day to day and the fundamentals of of the club are primarily run by women mm-hmm. and you get guys on a committee who'll sit there and they make decisions and you know turn up once a week for the committee meeting and I know that work hard at what they have to do but but the ones that are getting their hands dirty to keep the club running nine times out of ten are women yeah absolutely mm-hmm. absolutely. The, and the intro, I, mean, I think from a marketing point of view as well, when you think about the big, the biggest, one of the biggest stories to come out of the Olympics this year, and and the biggest story to come out of Rugby Sevens was the interview that Ruby Tui did mm-hmm. for New Zealand, and and there was follow up from that, the interview she did when she went back and was talking to you know I think was kind of ripping out one of the uh, of a news presenter like she was the biggest star this year at the Rugby Sevens, and it was women's rugby. And it just needs it just needs the coverage. It just needs to break through. If, if it can break through and people can show more interest in it, then that's I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay. So that's Scotland women. I didn't want to talk that much about the problems in Scottish yeah. women. I'm hoping I'm hoping the result will be better this weekend, and we can kind of actually talk about the rugby. But it kind of feels I don't know. I like you said. There's not like you said, Craig. Once you accept that, you know that they're essentially giving up that time for free. You can kind of criticise the slip tackles, but you know they know themselves what's going wrong. It kind of yeah. feels like kicking a, you know, kicking someone when they're down when it when, when someone's putting in that level of effort just just to turn up on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just as I say, it's it's um, you know once we once Scotland rugby are equal with the best in the world on the support and the back back you know uh, and uh, the support from the the union. And from the background staff, etc. Once they're on an equal uh, an equal footing with the men, I, I, I honestly we we cannot sit and criticise them too heavily. Um, obviously, they they have to be criticised for some of the things, that, some of the mistakes they make, because you know that's that's 
well, we'd be out of a job if we don't criticise people, I suppose. But, uh, um, but um, especially John, but he's not here to defend himself. But, uh, um, but on the other side of things, I think it's, um, as I say, I, 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 you know, you have to first of all take your hat off to them. You know? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll do pick of the six now. Um, we shall look at the super six. Uh, the Super Six games from the weekend because it was back on this weekend. Um, what, Harriet beat Watsonians again. Um, Ayrshire Bulls um, beat Southern County quite convincingly, and then Southern Knights um, steamrolled Borromeo Bears as well. Uh, Ian, you were you were at the Ayrshire Bulls. Um, the, there's a, a they have a song for Pat MacArthur apparently. Uh, yes, they do, um, and they've managed to make Pat MacArthur rhyme with Hallelujah. Uh, which is it's quite good. Um, obviously, because I'm just getting it played through a phone uh, by one of the coaching staff who will remain nameless. Um, but, you know, the parts of it that I heard were absolute genius. Uh, it was very clever. Um, quite profane, obviously. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> a Russell Club song? Yeah, you know. Would we have it any other way? Uh, but no, it's uh, quite quite impressive. I mean, it's ruined the now. Since you've told me that, that's completely. I, I thought the Alexander Burke version had ruined Leonard Cohen's <laughs> Hallelujah. For it, but, but now, every time I hear it, I'm just going to hear Pat MacArthur. Yeah. Pat yeah, yeah. Pat you know, you know, you know, I mean, I know, I know, I know. You know, Cohen started it, but I mean, it really kind of peaked with Buckley, and then it yeah. dive bombed with Burke. You know. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's gone a wee bit up, but um, yeah, but it's. You know, I'm not going to get out of here, you know. I know. It, yeah, it's, 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 take on it. Um, I didn't even Ian didn't even sing it to me. He just text me to tell me the song existed, and that was it. The song, <laughs> the song, the song's ruined. And I love Leonard Cohen as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, how, how was I mean? It was Ladies' Day here. How was that, Ian? Um, yes. Uh, well, I due to traffic and whatnot, um, and also because I'm I'm one of these people who just turns up not well close to the edge of time. Um, and also, I forget how long it takes to, to walk there from the where I park the car because I'm lazy. Uh, but no, it certainly seemed to go off very well. Um, I heard from Sarah Bell, who's the sort of Super Six SRU commerce person. Uh, there was already dancing on the tables um, <laughs> before the Bulls had kicked off because the you know the the air just air rugby club 15 first 15 they'd been playing beforehand and they'd won. Um, so it seemed to go down quite well. Uh, I think Sean Lanine when he was on the uh, the Borough Muir Southern Knights game on uh, Southern Knights game on Sunday, he said over three hundred and fifty women just solely turn up. They had their own marquee and everything, you know, which is probably where all the dancing occurred. But I had to be professional and uh, keep my eye on the game, you know. <laughs> it was a good game from an air point of view. I mean, it's... Oh. Some of the yeah, I because I think it was quite um, competitive for a stage during the first half. Uh, as Pat McCarthy said in the post-match interview, there was a sort of a good 12, 13 minute spell where Sterling had the majority of possession in territory, but um, Air kept on, sorry, Ayrshire Bulls kept on repelling them. Uh, they weren't maybe exiting well enough, but whenever Sterling came again, they won the ball back again and eventually. You know, the two tries just before half time were a killer blow. Um, Yari Fantini, arguably the player of the, the Super Six at the moment. Um, yeah, he, he had a f- another fantastic game and his double really finished off any chance Sterling had. Yeah. It was the same again, though, because I wonder, like, I know Sterling obviously were putting pressure on them, but the Sterling tries seemed to come when Air were quite comfortable. I think we've seen it before in the Super Six, where it's just like, oh, we're ahead here, and they just kind of switch off a little bit, Johnny. At the you know, when the when the other team are knocking on the try line a bit. Yeah, it, it's happened over and over again, and I think it's made a lot of games look a lot more competitive than they actually are. Like I've, I've happened to be a few times where I've seen the score line and thought, oh, that's 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 going to be a really good game. It looks really close, and then you watch it, and then one one team gets about thirty five points ahead. And then just seems to kind of switch off and the other team gets back into it. And, you know, I suppose as long as you don't lose the game, there's nothing really drastically wrong with doing that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it does. 
it does kind of give the impression that a lot of the games are much closer than they actually are. I think. Yeah. Um, Craig, can you put what's your, what's your been your pick of the six? Um, my pick of the six was uh, my favourites, the Southern Knights. <laughs> um, they uh, they looked uh, very convincing, um, and they they, they took a, again Borough Muir uh, come to the party looking quite strong, uh, and you think they're going to um, they're going to do a good job, and and I'm really I was quite, I'm quite impressed with Borough Borough Muir's roster of players. But again, the uh, Southern Knights were just uh, just too strong for them. Um, very, very organised in the forwards. Very, very strong in the in the set piece. But then had the uh, the, the ability to to take on Muir and find holes in their uh, uh, in their defence. Um, yeah, sorry. Well, no, I was going to say I think out, out of all the teams, the Southern Knights are the ones that seem to have found a bit more of a, a, a ruthlessness about them. That you know the. They really did kind of strangle Boromir and but you know Boromir took the try. I thought the Boromir try was really well scored. Yeah. Lead up to that was 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 excellent. There's not much that Southern Knights could have done, but out of the teams, and that's probably why they're, they're, they're top of the table, aside from the fact that the Borders team and that's where Borders team should always be. But um, <laughs> it, it's, I think they're they're the one team that found that ruthless edge because I was quite when I looked at it, I, I'd forgotten that air. Ayrshire Bulls had lost three games already. It kind of feels when you look at them, it's those, like Johnny said, it's those games where they were probably ahead for a lot of it, and then they've just let somebody back into it. Yeah, I think I think you know where for me the the the, the, the big thing with the Southern Knights is is that they are structured and they don't seem to have a um, they don't. It's not that they don't have an off day, but they, they've 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 worked their defence, they've worked their attack very very well. Maybe it's because Melrose have always been at the top level of of the Prem before that, um, and and so this team that, that that's come over has got a lot of the the Premier the Premiership side in in it. Um, and um, you know I don't know whether they're just they're just used to being at that level, but the 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 work they seem to have a good balance. Whereas Stirling, for example, seem or, or I thought had it. Were, were def- had a, a really good attack, but their defence was a little bit lacking. Um, and mind you, we've talked about defence being lacking in the Super Six quite a lot. Um, but it seems to be that um, you know where Harriet's managed to, for some reason, um, against Watsonians, seem to pull it out of the bag is quite amazing. You know. Well, that was it because like, it's amazing to think that what Harriet, well, what Watsonians did essentially, which is to go lose to Harriet's, then go and. Kind of seem to respond to that quite positively and have a very strong win, and then lose to Harriet's again. Which I don't know if it's just that Harriet's were, I don't know, stepping up in because it's a, a local rival or or what. But it, it 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 that's an odd couple of results that Harriet's have beat Watsonians because on the way things have gone so far, you wouldn't have thought that. But what I've seen of Harriet's so far. Um... They're very much a, a hit or miss team. Uh, it's sort of like um, Dave Rennie <laughs> style stuff. You know, uh, they've they've played a fast offloading game, and sometimes it's just not worked. And when they've come up against, for example, Southern Knights, um, they've they've been able to capitalise on any mistakes. But when things have come off, uh, they, they've come off spectacularly. Like uh, Stuart Edwards. Is that, yeah, the centre, Stuart Edwards. Um, he scored a couple of fantastic tries. There was one there against Watsonians and uh, one against Southern Knights in a game they lost, but they were very competitive in until they, they kind of lost their shape and, and Knights capitalised. Um, so they are one of these teams that if it sticks, uh, it sticks. Um, and if it doesn't, it can, it can unravel quite quickly. Uh, but you know, like Johnny said, some of the games... You know they they end up looking closer than they are, but they they always are these spells of real competitive um, periods, uh, and then uh, somebody ends up pulling away. Sometimes, yeah. Johnny, you got any pick of the sixes this week? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but did we sit here two weeks ago after the last round and say there's? Braid dead needless penalties being given away that are costing games in the Super Six. Yes, because that happened 
basically happens twice in that Watsonians Harriet's game in the 75th or 76th minute. Yeah. When Harriet's gave away a stupid penalty to put Watsonians in the lead. And then in the 79th minute, Watsonians gave away a stupid penalty and Harriet's kicked it to win. And like, it's, it just blows my mind that this keeps happening. It's like every round, someone gives away a penalty at the very end of the game and, and someone's got to kick a penalty to win. Like, tighten up your discipline in the last five minutes and stop it from happening. Yeah, yeah Premier Sports scripting. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not like the, you know, again, the, the, the officiating's been superb. I, I can't really fault yeah. it. Do you know the... They're, they're, they're given plenty of warning. They're not being coached like we've talked about before. They're just being told what they're doing wrong with the the binds not off at the mall, and then quite rightly getting pinged for the stuff. And there's the you kind of think they should they should be the. I don't think there's any difference in the disciplinary displays to what we would see at professional or national level. The difference is that the referees are actually reaching for their pockets and giving cards where. Actually, at any other level, those cards wouldn't be given because the referee would probably decide to let boys be boys. Yeah. Reputations aren't getting in the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, like, I, like you say, I think the standard refereeing has been pretty good. Um, there's maybe one or two things, you know, well, when isn't there one or two things that we don't criticise at any level? Um, no, no they, they communicate quickly. They, uh, I've, I've seen a good few 10 meter um, track backs for back chat, mm. uh, which is always encouraging to see because we want to stamp that kind of thing out of the game. Um, I, I don't think you can have any complaints so far. There's yeah. a good couple of penalty tries as well, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. um, this, this weekend, which, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, not that I'm saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's the laws, so yeah, that's fine, I accept that, but it takes a fair bit of um, uh, hootspur from the old. Uh, um, uh, referee to put a penalty try across, you know. Yeah, um, I saw a penalty so, try for for two infringements, I think, this weekend, and in the Lions tour, South Africa got five penalties given against them in their own five meter line, and no penalty try. So, or even a yeah. yellow was was a yellow card. Was that the, the yeah, yellow card yeah. given as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Times. And I think get that that that's it. It's just you know, then everyone knows what to expect. Yeah, if you're going to do this, if you're going to dick about in the twenty-two and by the try line. Giving away penalties, then I'm going to run under the posts. And although that that mm-hmm. was one thing, I think, just it, I just feel for the referees. The fact they have to pelt it under the posts, call the try, and then pelt it back to then card somebody who's at the other side of the page. I think just let them call it a penalty try. We know what it is. You say I'm giving away a penalty well, try here, lads. I'm not going to bother wandering over there. Point six, do, the, do like an H sign to say yes. That's, that's a penalty it. try. Yeah, that's yeah. it. It needs to be kind of yeah, some sort of hand signal. <laughs> two hands. I like the two hands up, Ian. Instead of like there a one in the try like that, two hands up. Yeah. Penalty try. No, even we don't even need to do this. None of this sticks nonsense. Penalty try. Penalty yeah. try. Yep. Just tell them. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> don't need any signals. <laughs> penalty try, lads. On you yeah. go. Oh yeah, it's it's like, yeah. Because you're gonna have a water boy in the sides of the pitch where you know earpiece in going. Oh yeah, these were the penalty try. You know, he'll relay the message. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even need my cup refs anymore. Yeah. Just get the water boy to relay the message to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> or one of the 18 substitutes, you know, warming up behind the, the goal lane. That's something you don't see in Super 6, which is quite refreshing. There's nobody like <laughs> pissing about in the in the, in the try line, is there? You know, it's just, I think they run up and then the touch lane a bit. <laughs> then it's right, get on. It's almost, it's almost like that's how rugby's supposed to be played. Aye, there's no medic, no medics on the field for like six hours just trying to help everyone out and hold a bit of time. It's just like on you come and no, away you go. No one from the medical staff screaming at the defenders to fold from the dead ball area. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Not that I'm still annoyed about that. Either. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll maybe touch on that hands in the rock later on. Um, anybody else got any other pick of the sixes? No, I think no. that's going to be a no. Then, yeah, <laughs> no. no, it's it's interesting. It's it's mixed. I think from a saying a couple of weeks ago, it looks like it's going to be Southern Knights, Ayrshire Bull, and Watsonians are going to be the top three teams, and they're going to pull away from everybody else. That's not what. That's not what's happening. So it's it's still Southern Knights, Watsonians, Ayrshire Bulls, but then Heritage Ayrshire Bulls are on seventeen, then Heritage are on thirteen. So it's still, I don't know. It's it's tighter than you would think. I think in the top four. 
So it's still um, be interesting to see how it plays out. It's, it's been a really good contest, actually. Yeah, and I think the fact it's been given its own opportunity. We've said before the fact it's given its own kind of space helps, and but it's nice as well. Even like you were saying that now club rugby's back, that Air were able to do that this weekend to put on a whole it was like a festival of rugby. So come along, see the first team. If you come to see the Air Bulls, you can see the first team beforehand, and it's quite nice, kind of that that, that it's mixing in a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, cause certainly numbers were up, and uh, also you know because the games have been good. Um, good advert for summer rugby, which, yeah. uh, of course, I'm an advocate for. Um, yeah. So it doesn't cra- clash with football seasons, or particularly kickoff times <laughs> on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come. We might come on that later then. Oh, um, I, think that, I think that ship has sailed. I, I it probably has. I think there was rants about that earlier, wasn't there? Um, I don't think there's any other news, particularly. Can, is anybody aware of any news? There is the very, very brief update that I don't think we covered, which is that uh, Al Kellick is still scary because he managed to get Glasgow a Friday night <laughs> and a Saturday night. So he did. It's it's not all as bad as it as it originally initially looked. Just walked on water across the Dublin and screamed in the face. <laughs> <Yeah. of the laughs> Went in, shut the door, and came back out five minutes later with two evening kickoffs. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Walked in and said, oh, Al, you're here. Here's a surprise. <laughs> he just went, Friday night. Oh, yeah, I'll sort that out for you. Good. <laughs> Have you seen that uh, sci-fi show Raised by Wolves? But there's, there's like a cyborg woman who can destroy people with her voices, like basically blow them up. I, I imagine that's like Al Kellogg. <laughs> well, she, was, she was high-pitched. It's um what about Black Bolt from uh, the Marvel comics? Who's an Inhuman? He can do that. He can destroy things with his voice. He has to go around completely mute most of the time. That's what I'll, that's how Kellogg. That's how Kellogg. Yeah. <laughs> no, but he's not completely mute. <laughs> everybody, everybody knows when Al Kellogg's not no happy about something. He knows his power and he uses it anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Here we man with great power comes great responsibility. Jesus is that an <laughs> Jesus is that an earthquake? <laughs> um, all right, Belters and Bams. Then this is we, we kind of talk about who's um, what's been good and what's been bad this week in terms of rugby in general. Um, Johnny, you got any Belters or Bams this week? Uh, yeah, I do have a Bam, and I was going to save it for Hands in the Rock. Um, well, if you want to swear about it, you can do because, or if you want to talk about it here, and I was, then... I was going to say, I'll yeah, I'll talk about it now without swearing because I think it should be on the one that everybody has to listen to. And if you want to hear me swear about it, you can come back and listen to it. Exeter Chiefs have sunk into belligerence now with this ridiculous mascot. There, there's like, there's no, there's no defense at all left for it. They've had all year to come up with this. They could have come up with absolutely anything, and that's what they produced. And then they bottled it and got rid of them within an hour. So this for people that don't know, the Exeter Chiefs, who are any regular listeners to the podcast will know, um, we, you know we, we, we we're not in approval of their branding because it's um, it's offensive because it, without permission, borrows from uh, indigenous peoples in uh, America. Uh, particularly First Nations peoples, um, and they this week uh, decided to launch their new mascot, Tom A. Hawk, who is a hawk called Tom, to which th- who they ziplined into the stadium, and he couldn't even get out of his harness. <laughs> they played the racist song while he was ziplining in. Yeah, which is the, the, the tomahawk chop that they, they all play and dance to. There is an interest. There is a serious discussion here to be had, though, because like, I know that like, people, some people grumble. This isn't a Scottish rugby issue, but of course, Exeter are, play, are playing Glasgow Warriors this year in the in the Champions Cup. If I've got that, is it the Champions? Because the, the yeah, the Champions Cup. Yeah, the grown ups one. Yeah, the grown ups one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Sorry, Craig. Um, what's what's your one called? Is it the Challenge? It's Challenge, challenge Cup. Challenge, Thank you very much. <laughs> the Challenge Cup. Sorry. Um, so the, the hang cup. on, hang on. I've got enough of, enough of it from the pair of them the last time. I don't need you're meant to be impartial on this on this. I'm podcast. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll stop, I'll stop now. I'll stop now. <laughs> anyway, um so Glasgow have got Exeter Chiefs. So there is an there is an issue now, I think, for 
for Glasgow fans and for, for any fans of Scottish rugby is should Glasgow allow Exeter Chiefs fans to turn up to Scotston for that fixture dressed in headdresses and full Indian gear? No. No. And that's I say, absolutely not. No. No. But they um, will. And the question for Glasgow Warriors is would you let somebody into the ground dressed as a minstrel? And the answer to that is no. So why will you allow Exeter fans mm-hmm. to come in dressed in Indian headdress? Well, I think people seem to forget, or the ones who, you know, when I'm using it, look, this band against racist, you know, and you, you get you, your Twitter response going, oh, bore off, yawn, we've been through this. It's like, yeah, you went through it very quickly and you've not actually read any counter arguments. You made your mind up yeah. far before anyone said anything. Um, that was right. Native American headdresses, that's the same as wearing like a Victoria Cross medal or a certain type of like, you know, armed force uniform. Those things are awarded to people of high stature, uh, you know, usually people who have, you know, achieved something in battle. Um, so what you're suggesting is that if you think it's fine to wear a headdress, you'd be fine with somebody turning up at the Cenotaph in completely faked military uniform, you know, try to take credit for know being a kind of war hero that's the kind of person you're looking at too and imagine the kind of folk who are saying that x or brandon isn't racist and blah, blah, blah bore off they'd be the ones who are extremely pissed off if anyone was to make fun or you know uh trying to take credit for things that uh you know a british armed forces person would do so they should shut the hell up um it is it's racist it's insensitive it's completely derogatory um yeah. and there's plenty of there's plenty of natural hawks that they could have named uh in devon there's there's a goshawk so they could have called it luke goshawk and then they could have had them walk out <laughs> some broth tunes there we go that and he's from that. i think the, the well is he not luke goss not from down there somewhere i don't know i will google it hang on <laughs> i don't wonder they can't cope they cannot you know it's one thing to um culturally appropriate uh you know first american people we don't, i don't want them culturally appropriate in bros as well let's just you know so they're from they're from london so you're right well luke was born in lewisham well do you know or, london according to wikipedia but place. i don't know have you have you been up have you been on the, the, he was, the bros wikipedia there cavi he was, was, that he, was con, yeah. he was born in lewisham london but as i'm sure there's a whole thing where he moved i think um Richard Herring talks about him being in the same year. They moved, I think, to Cheddar for a while because Richard Herring has a whole thing about being in school with them, with Luke and Matt Goss. But that's that's close enough. Some are set in Cornwall at the same place. Or Devon, wherever it is. <laughs> They're all the same down there. <laughs> I just, and I if just you're upset me more, saying but... that, then why aren't you upset with the fact that it's <laughs> branding? <laughs> Take a look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. What were you saying, Craig? Sorry. Okay, I, I just you see these 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 replies on Twitter and things like that, and saying you know, oh well, I'm sure I'm sure all the uh, Native American people uh, uh, in in uh, Nottingham are really upset about it too, and it's like it's that people just miss the point completely, and it's not that we're not asking them to. To, to change the name of the team. They can still be the Exeter Chiefs. It's just a simple, simple change that brings them, again, we've talked about this being on the right side of history and, yeah. and saying, look, just, you know, I'm covering old ground, but it just, it's like... Well, the one, the classic one you always get from Scotland, Scotland fans who kind of are, 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 are um, not against the Exeter branding is always, what about the Highlanders in New Zealand? And you're like, well... That area of New Zealand was col- was colonised by Scottish people. Yeah. There are strong Scottish yeah. roots in the area. They are honouring that history. And yeah. perhaps they shouldn't more for the reason that it's colonial rather than anything else and what those Scottish people probably did to the indigenous people of the area. But let's that, you know, <laughs> put that to one side. They're at least honouring some sort of link, yeah. to, the like, a- I... sort of link to the area. There is no link between Devon and the First Nations people. There is apparently some statue in Canada that someone has latched on to See, I, think the one I am a Highlander. Sorry. Sorry, the one like would be that you know a lot of the boats left from Plymouth 
in Devon and then colonised America. So that's it. Makes it even <laughs> more <laughs> even worse. Yeah, that's worse. Um, no, like, because I, I am a Highlanders fan, um, and I find the guy with the claymore a bit much. But they play in a place called Dunedin. Yeah, there is a there is a River Tay in Otago. There's a Lower Highlands in Otago. It is like basically where all the Scottish people went, and everything is named after places in Scotland. So it's a little bit different. And do you know where most of the New Zealand players that have gone on to play for Scotland come from? They come from that area, surprisingly, because they all have Scottish relatives. <laughs> yep. Well, there we go. Now, I just I, I, I was saying to Johnny, actually, funny enough, we were talking, actually, we were talking about um, in our chat as well, about I, I, I just, I'm now getting the feeling that they're just leaning into it now. The, the people who, who are own and are involved with the, the, the Blazers of, um, of Exeter Chiefs are now starting to just lean into this and say, Yeah, they're doing it on purpose know, for sure now. Yeah, and and I just think there's 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 saying you know well we we you know there's being racist because you've just gone along with the crowd, and but there's there's something really pretty despicable about saying well I'm I'm not changing my mind and I'm going to do, I'm actually going to make it louder, um, and I yeah. just I find that incredible. Um, it, it's at the point where I think if you do if you're deliberately taking a choice to name your mascot Tom a. Hawk, that's the point at which. The authorities should step in and say say something now. You up to this point, you can say, "Look, you know, we all thought this was fine a couple, a few years ago. Things have changed. Society's moved on. It's not fine anymore." But nothing's changed enough for us to do anything about it. But this is a clear change. This is a a deliberate choice now to to take the branding that step further. And you know, you look at the you know the SRU Constitution for if you are forming a new club in Scotland, it, the name has to be appropriate and the branding has to be appropriate and you would think premiership rugby must have those rules as well the reason that they've got a new mascot is that the mascot is what they gave up yeah when nice. when they yeah. did their when they did their initial consultation they said all right well actually we're fine with everything else but yeah okay we will get rid of the big native american big chief mascot guy so that was like that was their performative giving up look we've got rid of the mascot be happy now and then they replaced it with something even worse because <laughs> Like when they started with Big Chief, I suppose they could say like it wasn't a problem back then, or or we weren't aware that it was a problem. Now they know it's a problem because they did this consultation and the mascot was what they thought was the problem, and they replaced them with an obviously inflammatory new mascot. So someone's got to got to step in and say, "Nah, you're taking the piss now." Yeah, it's, it's like it's not just them. Like the fact that the a lot of the time you know totem poles have you know uh, some kind of bird of prey. At the top of them, so it's it's mm-hmm. almost like a deliberate piss take of that as well. Thing is, you got to you, you got to remember who we're dealing with here. There are actually people that had to have Tom a Hawk spelled out to them because they could have just called them Tom Hawk, and it, it, you, I think we would all got it. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, they had to spell it out phonetically for them. Well, if they call him Tom Hawk, everyone in Exeter would be like, going, "Well, why is he a bird?" <laughs> <laughs> um, is that Tony's brother? <laughs> I wonder if we can get. I wonder if they had it on a rental or whether they're not. They actually paid for that. <laughs> yeah, they're stuck with the suit now. <laughs> I hope they are. Can I get my deposit back? I hope it's a custom job and it cost them a fortune. <laughs> well, of course they can't get short sponsors at the minute. Exit. Yeah, yeah. So that's fun. Can you imagine pulling that going, Can you uh, sponsor? Uh, you fancy sponsoring one of the best rugby teams in England? Oh, I just give us two seconds. Why we just Google. Google, you just check. Is that oh, crap. No, 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 we're all right. <laughs> we're fine. Yeah. Um, any belters and bams for anybody else? Because that was part of, that was my bam this week. I didn't have a belter, particularly apart from Berwick won after having the first fixture postponed. So that's good. Yeah, well, it- I, I, my belters was Club Rugby. I was really impressed. That we had a, the, the Howie Fife had a great weekend, and uh, we were just talking about it before we came on air, Cami, and uh, it was great to be out and about and to to um, to uh, be involved in club pl- club club rugby and standing on the edge of the the pitches. Um, but the bams for me is uh, you, you may you may say that Edinburgh are in. Uh, are in a rubbish group, but I uh, saw you're in a rubbish cup. But my goodness, we've got some uh, some teams to play in the Challenge <laughs> Cup. Um, oh, so that's, uh, really and you've is. got the baddies as well. 
Yeah, we've got all, two bodies. All of England's got, bodies are coming yeah, up. Yeah, I'm surprised that I'm surprised they haven't just thrown Exeter Chiefs in the middle of it as well, and then we can all have some fun. Um, you know, having a London Irish, um, uh, Saracens. Not only that, though, we've got Breve and pa- Poe as well. It's like, oh, great! Now we've got to deal with uh, uh, alleged um, issues with other people and, and cheats. Not only that, but we're also going to get eye gouges at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That means you can't see them cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah, and and, and you know what's lovely is that with, is that um, a lot of the I I unfortunately didn't get to go down to uh, um, the ERS uh, uh, last weekend, but um, because of other uh, certain things coming up, but. Um, a lot of people are really, really happy with how close they are to the pitch. I'm really looking forward to being that close to seeing someone getting fish hooked. <laughs> and here's um, hoping it's somebody on the other side. The only other, <laughs> the only other bam I have is Alan Gilpin, but I think we might go into that in more depth than Hands in the Rock. Yeah, yes. we'll talk yeah. about global calendars and stuff like that in in hands in the rock. Uh, it's probably a good reason. Uh, as a point is anyway, reaching the hour mark on the on the main podcast, so that's normally where we like to leave it for this week. So, thank you very much, Ian, Craig, and Johnny for Patreons. If you give us a few minutes, we're just going to go and uh, we'll, we'll we'll have a, a refreshment break. Costume we'll, change. We'll stay with you on the live uh, mm-hmm. on the live stream. Um, we are very slowly on the live, other live streams going to say goodbye to everybody but for the audio listeners it's goodbye from me and goodbye from craig ian and johnny Bye. ciao